All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Victor Paredes Colonia. I'm part of our asset management team here at ServiceNow, and I'm really excited to bring another one of these live events for you all. At uh, this time, we're going to be focusing on HAM and with particular emphasis on the end to end visibility into your asset estate. Excited to have everyone. A few quick announcements before we get started. If you like this event or if you like these types of events and want to learn more or attend others and register for others, feel free to uh, scan the QR code here. Uh, there's going to also be a link in the chat where you can register and see a schedule of events that we have coming up. So as, as it pertains to this event, um, please bear in mind that some information is privileged and confidential. And so we want you to keep that in mind as we proceed, as well as some information is forward looking in nature. So they might be subject to change. Uh, as we answer questions, we might be looking at uh, the future and discussing things that are on our roadmap. So please bear that in mind. All right, a big warm welcome to everybody again. Uh, this is one of our, our commitment to you as the customer to help you deploy, adopt, and achieve value faster with your investments in ServiceNow. And in particular, with hardware asset management, we're going to focus on asset visibility. What does it mean um, when we talk about end-to-end -end visibility? And to do that, I've brought on some folks from the BU, uh, but I'll first introduce myself and Michael. We are part of the outbound product management team. We run these types of events, and we host these events, and we bring forward a lot of the guests that we have on these events. So uh, Michael, happy to have you with me today. And for our guests today, we have brought Lalit Gupta and Michael Smith, uh, both of which are product managers in the hardware asset management space. And Eric Farrington is also part of our product management team. He leads up and directs the product management group here for uh, ServiceNow. All right, so Mike, uh, thanks for joining us. Lalit, thanks for joining us. Today, we're gonna to talk about three key areas. The first is hardware asset management challenges. What are, what are customers facing today? Uh, and what, what are those challenges that you know, we want to bring to light so that we can help address how to resolve those? And we'll focus primarily today on end-to-end -end visibility. It uh, is a fundamental part of hardware asset management. And I'd like to dig into that and explain a little bit more on what that is. And then we'll talk about life cycle and the, uh, the workflows uh, that are prescriptive workflows to address the life cycle. As always, for those of you um, that are attending, please submit your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll answer those. And at the end of the session, we'll have a, a live Q&A session as well. Stay laser focused on the topic of the day. Um, if you have questions, please focus those questions on what we're discussing. And if you have any comments to share in the chat, I do recommend using the chat feature and get a lot of interaction. All right, let's get started then. Uh, so Lalit, thanks for joining. Uh, I, I wanna learn from you based on your conversations with your customers and the knowledge that you have in this industry, you know, what are the, the issues and challenges that our customers face today? Why is hardware asset management in some cases very difficult? Thanks, Victor. If we had to summarize this survey, this survey from the item review illustrate nicely that there are three main reasons cost visibility and x where cost account to nearly 42 percent and visibility account to 33 percent and x around account to 25 percent so when we say cost because a lot of money goes into the infrastructure asset so that's become critical visibility i need to know what i own where it is what how the life cycle management how the support is and when it comes to risk audit compliance. We agree with these reasons as they consistently come up with the customer's conversations. Whenever we are talking to the customer, we see they talk about cost, they talk about the visibility. So we agree with what item review is giving. If we expand on the reason, customer perform hardware asset management, these are the five main pillars control visibility, support, compliance, and scope. Represent the business challenges around hard, with hardware asset management. When I say control, so organization spends a lot of money into the infrastructure, but without any ROI. So they don't know where is my money going, which all infrastructure I'm buying. 
buying. So there is no standard process there is, which is coordinated by IT or any other supply chain. When it comes to the visibility, there are multiple systems, multiple places, multiple locations, but they are not integrated into one sim single dashboard or the place where I can see where my assets are, who is owning them or normalize asset data. So that's create a problem. And when we say support, today the organization is not limited to one office. They are distributed, they are decentralized and siloed and with COVID they are even remote also. So every house you have a remote worker now. It become even more magnified or the problem how I provide support or how I how I manage my hardware asset. And when it comes compliance, compliance is the bigger issues because you are distributed, you are decentralized, you have a strong CMDB or the relational database. But it is very difficult to predict or see the asset accuracy and that lead into the problems. Scope, asset is expanding. So 10 years back, it was just on-premise then it moved to the data center today, cloud, offline, all of these and asset themselves are expanding. So when we look into it, these five challenges plays a very critical role in hardware asset management. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just based on what you were saying there, Lilith, it, it sounds to me like there's just a lot of moving parts and, and, and hardware as it expands and gets more complex um, and different assets get in, get in, in in that scope of uh, IT, there's many things to manage. But one of the things that you mentioned that I see from the last slide to this slide is that visibility is in both, um, or at least mentioned in both. Yes, this is a good observation, Victor. And interestingly, visibility is really a fundamental reason why customers should pursue hardware asset management. Because if you think about it, without complete and accurate visibility, tackling and managing cost, because each hardware is associated with the cost, risks, and all other business challenges, what we discussed, like compliance, support, or any, any other thing, and even unachievable. So that's become critical. We need to have a visibility. And if I come into look into it, few example of the visibility, operational activities. When you say operational activities, the asset is associated with different kind of contracts. They are lease or how I am doing renewal, how I am swapping or disposing my asset. Then lessons true up, are they maintained properly or not? When it comes companies changes, so there are a lot of acquisitions and mergers are happening. And as a part of this acquisition and merger, are we managing asset also? Because when, when you do merger, the asset becomes a part of new organization. They need to be realigned, re reassigned. Workforce keep moving from one place to other place. How we manage all of this uh, asset. If, if, and when you go to the service sectors, the reduction is much more high and the number of people are more. And with remote worker, it again become very difficult to manage assets. Business initiatives. So business goes through the tough time, they go with the good times and asset need to be tracked or having a complete visibility. So if I have to cut my cost, how I can minimize the spend, spending on the asset. I need to know what is there in my stock room, how I can best utilize what is available, where they are available. So I can reduce the procurement cost, buying cost. Data center consolidation. Now everything moving to the cloud, data, data center becomes important. Where, what is the best place I should have a data center? What all asset I can put into the data center that become critical. Until unless I have a visibility about the asset, this is not possible. And digital transformation with industry moving towards the digital, we need uh, to know where the asset is, how can I click and use those assets. So visibility is required critical. When it comes to compliance, 
as more and more assets are getting added and missing a visibility result into the problems. So vendor audits are required. So it can be based stock room or the location audit to know, do I align with what I show on the papers? Government and industry regulations required us to make sure that our assets are up to date. We are not having any warranties issue, life cycle issues, so on. Then comes the security risks. Basically, the asset can be lost because asset is moving. It's not static now with remote, distributed, and silo. Visibility into the cloud. What goes into the cloud? What is on, on premise? So if I'm not aware of it, I'm, I'm going to get into the security problems. Somebody can hack and take data. So all of these results are successful if we know where the asset is, if I have the visibility and I have workflows, I have things which can give me the bigger picture and I can go deep into it, the asset. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm convinced visibility is, is crucial to hardware asset management. In fact, it's, it's fairly crucial to anything that's asset management. Let's talk a little bit then about what we mean by end-to-end -end visibility. Mike, what, what do we mean by that and how should we think about it from a ServiceNow perspective if we're a, a ServiceNow customer? Yeah, absolutely. The, the thing that we have to rem remember these days is assets are not always going to be in a static state where they're going to sit in one place. And as they progress through the life cycle from the time they're procured to the time they are disposed of, they need to be properly tracked. And, and so there's lots of inputs and a lot of factors that happen throughout the asset life cycle. Um, and that's true also in how data comes into the, to the, to the repository. So we have to realize that in a perfect world, the assets are created when they're procured. So you've got a set of data that comes from a procurement system or from receiving activities. But that's not always the case, especially in, in your, your state now when you're standing up a new environment, you're gonna have legacy data. You may also have a challenge of having siloed environments where you have certain groups managing their assets. Bringing them into a, a central repository can be a challenge because you know, your network team might keep their own database of assets, whereas the data center team may have their own system of record. So bringing all this data in, whether it's from procurement, the siloed sources, legacy data, vendor APIs, third-party companies could be managing some of your inventory as well. It can be a challenge to consolidate all into one usable, readable database. So, you know, one of the things that we covered and we configured and set up in our previous webinar, and if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend you to look it up, is our content service and normalization engine. So as the data comes in, it doesn't matter how it gets into our data, into our database, we're going to normalize it, we're going to clean it up, and we're going to give you some nice data to work with. Not only are we going to clean up the manufacturer model and, and, and product information, we're also going to provide lifecycle dates that'll provide you some intelligence. So as the asset moves throughout its life, you've got these dates to reference to make proper decisions as, as that happens. Um, and with our content service, um, you know, you'll get an initial massive load of oh, well, over 2 million models that are in our content service now. But we understand that that's, we're not done. Our content team is actively today, as we speak, are going through and finding more models, more manufacturer lifecycle dates. And they, you're, they're getting a consistent feed of all of our, un, our customers' unnormalized data to clean up. So every day when they come into work, they have a, a list of, of assets that come back anonymously that they go through and they find more matches for. So every week you'll get an update of, of, of newly created content, our content service. Um, normally when our customers turn this on, day one, they're usually around 20 or 30% because it takes a while for this content service to work and to, to scrub up the data. But normally after a week or so, once, once everything is settled, um, we find that most of our customers are achieving around 80 to 85%. And if you're not at that level, then there's usually some configuration settings that need to be addressed. Or maybe your discovery is not bringing back manufacturer or simple things like that. Um, so there's usually a little bit of cleanup that needs to happen on day one. But once this has happened, you're going to have a nice set of data that you'll be able to use throughout the rest of the life cycles of the assets. Oh, that's great. So the end to end then is really the initial input of data and then the continual cleaning of that data through the content service, which gives kind of rise to you, you able to take action with, with uh, 
with that data set. Is that, is that how I hear it? Absolutely. Because there's, you know, as you know, the asset lifecycle here, you can see it starts with the acquire um, uh, phase of an asset. You, you need to know certain informations as you're acquiring assets. So is this model still generally available? Can we still buy it? Um, all the way through the disposal section where they have end of life dates that you need to make sure, okay, these, these laptops are no longer supported, so we should dispose of them. So this content data will be used throughout your entire asset life cycle. And remind me, how how is it uh, that we conduct or do the hardware normalization piece, and how important is that that aspect to this end to end visibility? So the normalization happens as soon as the the record's created. So with your with your instance, um, you'll when you when you first turn it on, you'll get uh, a large update of co content. In some cases. Um, there's, so there's business rules that run at night that bring over this data. So what it'll do is, is day one, it'll go through and it'll look at your model table and it'll create a normalized model that'll be associated to the asset record. So when you look at the asset, you'll be able to see a normalized model, normalized manufacturer, and there'll be a, a related list for any life cycle dates that are associated with that model. And, and like I said before, any, any information that you have that does not get normalized, it could be from, the procurement system isn't putting the right uh, fields in um, or uh, discovery isn't discovering or populating the data that you need. Any unrecogn unrecognized data will be sent over to our research team. And in some cases, it may be a new model that just came to the market that we don't have a lot of uh, information on and our content service team will go out and, and they'll create that. And so in the next update, you'll get an update and from any of your dashboards, you'll be able to see um the uh when the next service update will be and when you're going to get that payload um and if if you find that you're struggling you can always reach out to our um our, you know your high support and in some cases we find that maybe discovery wasn't bringing in model so you have a very low um, normalization percentage but you'll have all the dashboards and tips in our model management workspace in, in our in our in our new hardware asset workspace you'll be able to see the percentage and what models are, are being normalized. Yeah, and, and, and Mike, I think one of the things that's uh, important to note is that the normalization, and I think you mentioned this, but the normalization, once it's once it's there and available, it, it can, the data can be used not only for the workflows within HAM, but it could also feed into other other components of, of the ServiceNow platform. So I think that, that piece actually also elaborates what visibility can mean for, for a customer. Um, with the grand scheme of things. This example yeah, here that I uh, dug up when I was putting this together, I thought this was a very interesting way of uh, kind of visualizing how normalization works. Do you mind walking us through this one? Sure, absolutely. So every model, and like I said, whether it's created from a procurement system or from ServiceNow Discovery or through an integration with SCCM, we're looking for three data points. We're looking for who made it, what it is, and the specific number. So for example, we have an Apple MacBook Pro here um, and SCC, you know, Jamf could be discovering it in the first example here as Mac Facebook Pro because that's how it's set in the BIOS. Uh, procurement, somebody could have fat fingered it and typed in MAC in all caps and then book in, in lower caps. Um, and then um, another discovery tool or uh, another integration could have brought it in and spell Apple wrong, right? There's all kinds of issues. And especially if you have a legacy system of, of where you relied on a lot of manual processes and human hands, you're gonna have a lot of human error. So it doesn't matter how those come in. We're, you know, So that's the MacBook Pro 15 Apple is telling us the manufacturer and the really the model, the product name, right? That's the specific name. But we know that for every Apple MacBook Pro 15, there's probably 300 different versions, right? There's a different model number for a US version as there would be for a French version because they have different keyboards, they have different power cords, so they have a different SKU number. So by having all three of those items, our normalization engine will bounce it against our content service and they'll bring back Apple. Doesn't matter if it was misspelt the first time or not capitalized properly, the normalized manufacturer name will just be Apple. And, and now we're, we're able to report on all of our Apple stuff. Our service desk will know that it's Apple. They won't, what's a Pell? You know, they, some people are very literal with this stuff. Um, so now you're gonna have a clean standardized um, 
you know, normalization database. And as long as we're getting these three, these three input points, whether it's from discovery or an integration, you're going to have a very successful normalization process. Oh, that's great. And, and I guess one of the things I'd ask is how do you ensure that you get those data points uh, into HAM? What are some of the recommended um, practices in order to ensure that you get complete and, and in some cases, most of the time, accurate data so you can get that normalization engine working properly? Absolutely. And in a lot of cases, it's one small error or one small configuration tweak that can save mm -hmm. thousands of, of, of issues, right? It could be something as simple as letting the procurement team know that, um, you know, the, the description field that they're seeing on a purchase order isn't the model name, right? And, and you'll find that you'll get a lot of repeat errors um, to cause this. Or maybe with the integration with SCCM, maybe you're not bringing back the, the model number, you're just bringing in the model name. Right, you're just bringing in that general description, where the model number is built into the BIOS. It's there. We're just not telling the discovery agents or the integrations to look for it and populate it. So a lot of that stuff, it, you know, one of the things that there's a there's a very um, symbiotic relationship with the configuration management database, the CMDB, and the asset database because the configuration data will provide a lot of um, great information, but it'll also provide a lot of bad information if it's not configured properly. And in a lot of cases, maybe you haven't been concerned about this information because you haven't really had a need to use it yet. But now that you're, you know, you're maturing your hardware asset space, now is time to, to go in and, and partner with. In a lot of cases, it's often the same person that wears the same hat for configuration management that does it for asset management, or they work together very well lockstep. So then in, in, in that case, visibility may even start as early as having the right CMDB data clean and yeah, accurate absolutely. so that you can start making use of it, right? So it's um, yeah. starting out of the gate and just say, hey, I'm going to start normalizing, maybe a little, sometimes maybe in, uh, premature. Yeah, and, and, and there's, a, there's a synchronization between assets and CIs. So if you haven't started your asset management maturity process, but you've had config running for years, you're going to mm -hmm. find assets have already been created because there's a synchronization that happens with certain classes based on how it's configured. Nice. Okay, now I like to talk about um, workflows because now as a as an end-to-end -end visibility, it's one thing to look at the asset, know where it's at, where it sits and have accurate data, but it's another to actually start making use of it. And I think when we talk about end-to-end -end visibility, we're not just talking about the static state, right? We're talking about it's an ever-changing state and what, what you're actually going to do with the data actually gives you visibility into other business outcomes. So let's talk about that, Mike. Um, what's the best way to think about workflows uh, with, within HAM? Sure, sure. So one of the challenges most organizations have um, with managing assets is how they can manage them outside of the, outside of the time they're plugged in and being used, right? We have discovery tools, we have, you know, patching agents, we have all kinds of things that can connect our infrastructure when everything's plugged in and on the network. But where we lose visibility is when something gets unplugged or something gets received. It's much harder to manage cardboard as it is to manage an active server that's rack stacked and, and plugged in and running, right? So that's where our workflows come into place. And since our Paris release, our focus with every release has been to introduce additional workflows that not only give you a process, an end-to-end -end process, um, whether it's a workflow for a simple, I need something, a, a catalog request to, to the entire stage of the life cycle to that, that item's received, or it's a tech refresh or disposal. But so we give you the process that, that's required to deliver these services. And we try to put asset management in the background so the technicians that are working through these workflows are doing the work and the asset updates are happening automatically through the background. A very common issue that we find with our, with our customers is, is just a simple break fix. You know, a caller calls in with an incident, they have an asset that's broken, they need it replaced. And the technician, their focus is getting this person back to work and getting them a device that's working or fixing the device that they have. Their focus isn't keeping the asset management database up to date. That's the last thing that they're focused on. They just want to get this person up to work and jump into the next queue. Um, so as these assets are coming in, um, you know, and one of the personas that we have here um, is, is around Casey. You know, Casey's a hardware manager for a big hospital. And 
And there's constant technology going in and out, whether it's through brake fix or tech refresh. And as this stuff is happening, they're starting to collect assets that are no longer deployable, whether they're defective or they're past their useful life. Now that Casey has a normalized database, he knows now that his asset life cycle, what assets need to be disposed due to their age. And because of processes that were put in place, he has assets now that are sitting in a warehouse that are pending disposal. So, so now that, um, you know, cause for Casey, he, he managing a hospital, they have to maintain HIPAA compliance. So he needs to make sure that there's a process in place. that's going to ensure that all the data bank equipment gets wiped and gets properly disposed. So if they get an audit, they can say, yes, these hundred laptops were disposed. Here's the request that they were disposed through. Here's a certificate of disposal that lists all the assets that are associated with that. Every asset now has, a, has an updated retired state. They have um, all the dates of all the activities that happened in the disposal process are, are put in into the asset record. And now they have full accountability. So if any audit comes through, that Casey can rest assured that they're doing, that they're, that they're properly updated. So our disposal process um, will take any assets that are in a pending disposal state and allow you to simply add them into a, to a disposal workflow. And now you have awareness, right? Because now you know what is, you know, you can look at your stock rooms and see how many assets are pending disposal. So you can schedule your disposals. Um, the end-to-end -end process goes through validating and saying, okay, these are the 100 assets. You schedule a pickup with your disposal vendor and the disposal vendor comes and picks them up and you verify that each asset that you, you originally um, added to this process gets picked up. And then the vendor sends you a, a certificate in the background. And when it's done and you can validate that, okay, the vendor says, I picked all these up. These are the ones I asked them to pick up. Great. And you can close the disposal task. And what happens throughout that process is that the asset manager never has to go back to the computer with a spreadsheet and import it or go through and manually update 150 assets that just got disposed. These assets went into an in-transit state when they were picked up. So they show that they haven't been retired yet. But they were picked up, and then when the when the the workflow gets closed, now all the assets move to a retired state, and it, they have the vendor they were retired to. They have the disposal request attached to it, and they have a, a trace a, a path right back to the certificate of disposal. So this is just one example of one of our workflows, and this process could never be done through automation, right? You can never have discovery help you with the disposal workflow because these these haven't been plugged in for a while, and they might not ever be plugged in again. But what you don't want is you don't want assets that are still in your environment showing up outside in other organizations or other people. It can go back online and you might have certain agents that come in. If this stuff happens, yeah. now you've got a workflow that you can tie it back to. Yeah, so you said this is not the only workflow. So I'd like to jump into that. So what are some other, what are some other workflows or use cases that we've seen customers leverage HAM uh, when it comes to the automated prescriptive workflows? Sure, absolutely. And, and, and so it starts really um, with our request workflow. We have a standard hardware request workflow that covers, and all of our workflows, I should point out, we design them intentionally as low-code prescriptive workflows. We understand that we're not going to make a process that's going to be perfect for every organization. But what we did do is we created these workflows so they're easily able to be modified and configured to meet your organization's particular needs. So from a request standpoint, if you have a approval chain that's required on a certain dollar amount, you can add that to the, re to the request workflow. So if it requires, if it's over $2,000, you can skip level approval, you can put that into the workflow. It won't break anything. It's just an additional step that'll get added to it. So we have a request workflow that does the entire process from request to sourcing to you know, deployment. And, and this is something that we, you know, we have processes that allow our remote end users to receive assets at home. So now if you work from home, you can pull up your mobile device and scan your asset and that will update the asset record in the background. So before this assets even went online, we already know it exists because we had a, a, a re re receiving task and we already know it's there. So the configuration data will catch up to the live asset. Um, we have uh, different deployment workflows, whether it's through um, tech refresh or through standard requests. So we have different tasks that get executed. Um, while an asset is in, in the inventory space, maybe it's defective and you need to work with the vendor to do an RMA, a return merchandise authorization. 
So we have an end-to-end -end workflow that covers all the steps in that, whether you have to have the vendor come on site or you have to send the asset off site. We take into account all those activities and all those decisions that happen. Maybe the vendor fixes it. Maybe they say we can't fix it or it's too expensive to fix and we replace it. We have a, you know, we have different different tasks that update the asset record or create new assets as, as, as a result of the RMA process for you. Once again, though, you, your technicians are just working these tasks. There's no going back in and making updates because all the asset updates are automated in the background. That way, the technicians can focus on doing the work and not the busy work, the administrative work to go back and behind uh, and fixing this. We also have workflows around leases, right? Um, when it's time to for a lease to be renewed, we have a workflow that walks you through that whole end-to-end -end process. We have another one around... Uh, uh, when somebody goes offline or somebody gets off boarded from an organization, everything that's assigned to them, whether it's software, SaaS subscriptions, mobile devices, mobile carrier plans, hardware, anything that's assigned to the end user will be tasks created to reclaim it. So now we're doing a better job of getting all of our equipment back into the organization. Um, and then we have another, another popular workflow for tech refresh. And this, this is for, it can be done for one asset or it can be done for a thousand assets, as many assets as you want. And this allows you to plan and execute all the activities that happen during the tech refresh, even reclaiming the asset that you're replacing um, and the, st the steps that are required to ensure that that asset goes right into the disposal process. So oh, and those great. are the bulk of our big workflows. And we have, a, we have a new workflow coming in the Tokyo release around contract renewals. Um, and that's a better together with our SAM tool. So it'll walk you through all the steps required for a maintenance contract, for example, um, to get that renewed and, and to be proactive with this, these activities. Once again, they, the selfishly helping asset management, but not putting asset management in the, for, in the forelight, but having all the updates happen in the background. So we can ensure that our data stays um, accurate because that's with visibility. Yeah we need to have a clean view of our asset estate. And, and all these activities that I just described are areas where data can erode. Yeah, and, and to that point, that, that uh, visibility has to be an ongoing uh, practice, right? And, and these workflows help, help also do that by keeping things constantly updated as, the, as it moves through the life cycle. Absolutely. And at any stage in an asset's life cycle, there's opportunity for data to erode. And, and, for, and once data starts to go bad, maybe it's from technicians not updating, they didn't update the break mm -hmm. fix. So now you've got an asset out in the world that it says it's in a, in a stock room, but someone's using it. And then you've got an asset in a stock room that shows that it's still assigned to an end user. That may seem like one small little issue, but if that happens 50 times a week after a while, people start oh, losing yeah. confidence in the data. Yeah, no, no, I believe that. You said something else that uh, there's more workflows coming out in the future. So it's safe to say that that uh, the, the, these workflows build on top of each other and they expand and they, they multiply and there's many different use cases. So over time, there's going to be a lot more different workflows that, that folks can leverage. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have, like I said, we've got the contract workflow, the maintenance renewal workflow coming in our, in our upcoming release. Um, so today we covered, um, you know, deployment, swaps, retires, refresh. We do have a workflow for loaners. I forgot to mention that. Um, this will allow you to maintain awareness when you've got loaners out there in the field that haven't been returned. Once again, helping with that visibility, because when an asset gets shoved in a drawer because someone forgot to turn the loaner on, without this process, you're not going to know it's there. And, and so that's a big thing. Um, yeah. And uh, but so upcoming workflows we have we have contracts coming in the in the next uh, Tokyo release in just a few weeks, few days um, in Utah. Uh, the release after that, we're working on a donation workflow to allow customers meet their ESG mandates, and, and instead of disposing of assets, working with local charities to dispose their assets, but to do it in a way that's safe, that protects the organization, but still provides value to the charity that they're working with. And we have several other workflows that, that we're planning that I believe we've got some uh, some question or some survey questions about that you know you guys' input may help guide us on what workflows come next. Yeah, yeah, and in next week's session, we're actually going to get in depth on some of these specific workflows and kind of go into product and and look at how to uh, leverage the data in hand to carry out one of those workflows. 
But maybe we can just start here and just as a general practice, what are some leading practices related to workflows that our customers can think about as we move into next week's session? Yeah, so I think next week we're gonna we're gonna do a deeper dive into the disposal process. Okay. And we're gonna also talk to the tech refresh process because the tech refresh process covers a lot of activities within an asset life cycle. It, it, it covers the planning, it covers the sourcing. Like if we're doing a tech refresh, we need to either buy or ensure we have enough assets to replace the old assets. It covers the prepare and deployment stages of that. It also covers the reclaim and getting those old assets back. So the tech refresh is a great workflow. Um, it's probably one of our most complex workflow because of all the, the major muscle movements there. Um, but yeah, it's definitely going to be a, a good one. So we'll, we'll dive into those and how you can help set them up and configure it and how you can make updates. So you're looking at Flow Designer right here. And if anyone's worked in Flow Designer, I know your sysadmins have. Very easy to just drag and drop the little, what they call the pills on the, on the right side of the, the screen. You can drag them and drop them in between any steps. It's very easy to use. It requires very little coding, um, and and you know our customers have had great success configuring and really making these processes land in their environment. Because um, one of the challenges is always adopting these processes. You guys may have a process in place. You may have a site that somebody goes to 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 do a request. Maybe it's a, a team site or or something like that, or a, um, you know something on on on. Uh, I, you know, on, on a different platform. Now bringing all of this into the ServiceNow platform will make the end user experience much smoother and much more streamlined. Well, that's great. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that and, and um, clarifying end-to-end -end visibility and how that actually leads into the workflow process. And again, we're gonna talk a lot about that in the next session. We'll actually do some specific examples uh, with data sets. All right. Uh, I, I did see some questions come in the chat. Uh, I, maybe it's the right time to open up for questions. We do have some, some um, dedicated time for that. I did see a few questions come in uh, and I see more coming in as well. So Michael, why don't you kick us off with some questions uh, and then direct it to Lilith and Mike. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I have a couple questions here from Ed. Um, Ed would like to know a little bit more information on obtaining assets, for example, creation of assets that are discovered instead of those that are procured following the hand process. And is there a best practice to deal with this? So, think, so I, I always say that um, the best practice for when we, when we create an asset, an asset should be created. Um, you know, I, I see your, you know, focus on discovery, but there's a whole segment of the assets life cycle from before it gets discovered that needs the asset needs to be accounted for. It needs to be properly sourced and procured. It needs to be received into a stock room. It needs to be audited while it's in that stock room to ensure that it's there. Um, and then once it goes online, then you've got discovery and integrations to, to do that. So we offer nothing but best practices around the, the procurement, receiving, and inventorying of the assets. And Ed, I was just typing another question I see you had around stock rooms. Um, and that's a great question, and, and I'm going to answer this live. I was typing the answer, but I'll go ahead and answer it live while, while we're here and we're talking to you. Um, one of our Can we just read the question again, Michael, before you yep, answer it? Yep. Thank yep. You. So the question is about the visibility of assets in a stock room. And you're correct. Our stock rooms are a huge amount of assets and hard to locate within that stock room. Are there plans to register and maintain asset positions on where they're located in the stock room? Yes, absolutely. So today we track assets that are in inventory or in stock to a stock room. And we know that sometimes a stock room is as small as a network closet or is as huge as a football field. So, it, you know, starting with our Utah release, advanced inventory management is going to be a feature that we're going to be um, doing a lot of great innovation with. But the first thing we have to do is create a data model to support that. So in the Utah release, right now we're in the, the development design phase of that. Um, we're going to be adding for any asset that's in a stock room, you'll have additional attributes for aisle and space. So think of it when you go to Ikea, um, and you have to buy that bookshelf, you get that little printout, it shows you what aisle and what space your equipment's in. Or if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you're looking for a part, you know it's an aisle 52 row, you know, or space 16. And once you get there, you can track your stuff down. Um, that's going to allow for future advancement and stuff like creating pick lists or, um, you know, putting stuff on pallets and so on and so forth. But it's going to allow you to really know, great, it's in a stock room, but where is it in a stock room? And it's going to help, you know, not only 
um, your accuracy of your assets. Because once again, we can't rely on discovery. You may be using RFID, which can help in your stock room, but most customers aren't. So now we're providing a way for you to track and maintain visibility more granularly within a stock room. So great question. Yeah, but yeah looking yeah. forward to that coming in the Utah release. Thanks, Mike, for answering that. Yeah. Um, please keep the questions coming. Um, these are really awesome. And I'm going to actually go to some of our answered ones so we can broadcast them more widely for um, an, a, an audience. Um, Amit had a question here about with the world moving towards virtualization. And as we pointed out, the scope of hand been increasing with that. Um, can you please uh, shed more light on the concept with regard to virtualization? As most of the hand functionalities like procurement, lost and stolen, stockroom, et cetera, will not be relevant to virtual. Um, Lalit, I know you took a stab at this in the chat, but maybe you could speak about it to a broader audience. Yes. So we have, uh, when we say hardware, hardware are mainly the physical asset, but today the things are moving towards the cloud and towards the virtualization. So anything which is not a physical, we have a software asset management. If it is a software SaaS or subscribe base or on-premise. And when it comes to the anything like cloud virtualization, we have the cloud. Those two products capture those details. All right. Thank you, Lalit. Um, another question in the chat that was uh, sent to me here was, to what extent does all my model data need to be normalized in order to leverage the automated workflows? Is there a minimum amount and any recommendations we can consider? So Mike, do you want to take a stab at that one? Sure, sure. And that really comes down to the, you know, your organizational ITAM governance and policies that you configure. Um, to be fair, you can use our workflows with, you know, with bad data, right? You can have a house party without cleaning your house, right? It's up to you to decide how clean you want your environment to be. Um, with normalization, I mean, if you have the feature, you might as well have the normalized data, right? And you can opt in and, and get all that, that cleaned up. Um, to be fair, I mean, you, you know, there's, you know, there's no rule of thumb for how often you should be using it, but that's kind of the, the way I look at that. Awesome, Mike, I love that analogy about the house party. Um, let's see, we have some more questions coming in the chat. Um, and some of these are quite specific, but we'll see what we can do on this call. Janie had a question here about a process framework consisting of policy, process, and practice that she's writing. And she wants the ServiceNow process flow to demonstrate the practice. Do we have any advice uh, for Janie sure. with regard to writing this? We actually have, they're available in our, in our um, success portals um for uh, it's a process guide so it's a it's a white paper for lack of a better term that explains in great detail our processes with the different roles that are involved from an asset manager perspective it gives some guidance to setting that up um either work with your partner or your your account team and getting that information to you we have it i just um it's in our success center um, and should be easy to find. If you search for ITAM process guides or HAM process guides, you should be able to find it. We keep them up to date with each release. Fantastic. We had a question here that was answered. Um, can you tell us more about the contract renewals piece? This is essential for SAM. Um, I think we can talk a little bit more about the better together between HAM and SAM on this question. Yes. So what exactly the, the contact uh, renewal workflow we have introduced in, into the Tokyo release, which is uh, out two weeks back. And as part of this con contact renewal, like uh, any expired contract, uh, it may have a child, it may have a grandchild, so on. So when, when you open, I just want to highlight one more thing from a hardware asset management, we are supporting maintenance and warranty. Those two contract type, but the remaining contract will come into the future under same harbor. So we don't know when, when they're going to add that. And under so software SAM, we are supporting soft, software and subscribe base. So when you, when you click on the, and need to make sure that you need to have both HAM and SAM installed to utilize the features of both HAM and SAM. If you only have the SAM, then you will be able to do the SAM related renewal part. If you have both, both HAM and SAM, then you will be able to do. So when you open any expired contract uh, and you click on the renew, it will take you through whether you want to continue with the classic 
workflow you want to continue with the new and once you select the new one it will create a renewal request and in the renewal request some part will be the common and some part of the task will be at the request level the first task it will allow it will show you all the list of child grandchild so on and allow you to select which all contract you want to renew as part of this main contract and once you select that then it will create a request line item for each of the contract and you can open each of this request line and then start working with filling the renewal details like start date and date and we do all all the checks to make sure that dates are matching correctly and then approval once you are done with this task it it will allow you to select an asset now if you have an hardware asset ham installed then it will allow you to select an asset which you want to be part of this contract and if you have a sam installed it will allow you to select the sam part of the assets and once you are done with this particular task it will go to the next task where you have to select the terms and condition rate card and after you are after you are done with this it will go with the approval approval is at the main request level and once the approval is done it will take you through the po process the po we want tomorrow if somebody want to know the total cost of ownership for an asset so it goes to the po where the po is created and it is received and the cost are updated the another thing we have updated as part of this uh, particular renewal workflow is the contract history so when you go to the history tab you will be able to see what was the parent contract or the previous contract and which is current contract so you will be able to see the complete history of a contract from where it is coming and which was what what it was before that does that's this that's a great yeah that's a great description of that but just just to be clear though the uh the Tokyo release isn't isn't fully live yet um, and there'll be all kinds of documentations and process guides that will come out along with the release as part of our go to market activities um, so you'll be able to implement that feature once once Tokyo goes live. And there'll be there'll be demos and other stuff around the contract closer to the actual go the actual launch of it. Yes, yeah, thanks, Mike and Lillet. Yes, we, we love these questions. Keep them coming. Um, here's one I really like about um, from Ed again about EAM. So he asked, we talk about hardware IT assets. New in Tokyo is enterprise asset management. Um, which relates to non-IT assets. And as far as I can tell, it seems like HAM. Uh, what are the relationship between HAM and EAM? And I know this is something that we've been talking about a lot as we can excitedly um, you know, speak to y'all about EAM. So I'll let Mike uh, speak to this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So enterprise asset management will be a, a new product. It's actually, that did come out in advance of our Tokyo release. Um, so that's available today. If you're interested, work with your account teams and then getting you guys a demo and, and seeing what, what's in store. There is a lot of similarities between enterprise asset and hardware asset management, but there's also a lot of uniqueness between the two systems, right? Um, and that can all be explored through a, a demo with EAM. But the spirit is the same. It's having that same visibility to your enterprise assets as you do your hardware assets. Um, and there's different whys and hows uh, that 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 is ex is executed, um, but the theory is the same. We you know there's a life cycle of an enterprise asset, whether it's a, a piece of machinery, um, medical equipment, um, a fleet of vehicles. However, you need to manage those assets. We've provided this a lot of the same workflows, but they're they're tailored for the enterprise experience and licensed a little bit differently as well. But definitely look for, there's all kinds of documentation that came out for that um, and work with your account reps and account teams and getting a demo in and getting and getting some awareness around that because that's, you know, HAM was our fastest, one of our fastest growing uh, product areas. EAM is going to be even faster. The demand for it is very high. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, thank you, Lilith. One more scan here, and I think we are ready to move on um, to wrap this up. So, Victor, I will pass it back to you. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Lit. Really do appreciate you answering those questions. And thanks to everybody for posing those. I think those are very valuable questions. So we talked a lot about different topics within this session. Um, there's a couple of resources that we want to share with you. We'll be posting those in the community once we load this uh, recording up there. Uh, the first is automating 
hardware asset management with workflow. So you'll get an inside look into a lot of things that Michael and both Lilith talked about today. Um, now on now, how we are actually using um, hardware asset management uh, within, within ServiceNow. And then there's additional trainings related to hardware asset management, not least of which is HAM Fundamentals. Uh, but then there's also the HAM Simulator, which gives you a little bit of hands-on practice with the product. And then we also have Delta trainings. Um, what's the difference between release, uh, last time release, and this, this new release that we just put out? Uh, so you'll see that. And Victor, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but one, there was a question in chat about one of the, the contract feature that will be covered in the Delta training as well. Um, and uh, it, it will be part of the instructor led ham training past the Tokyo release. Um, so I know, I think it was Janie who was asking about that as well. Awesome. No, thanks yeah. for that, Mike. So, and that's a common theme, right? Uh, anytime we have new releases, we're gonna have new features and that's what those trainings, those Delta trainings are, are meant for, to capture those. Uh, the other thing I'd, I'd like to just leave you all with is, uh, a mention of our ITAM community. This is where we have posted our getting started guide, which has a summary of how to set up for success with HAM, as well as a list of trainings and other materials that we find are very helpful for customers as they either onboard with their HAM journey or they continue to develop uh, in, in hardware asset management. So be on the lookout for that. And without further ado, the other thing I'll say is we really appreciate you guys joining us. We're gonna have way more of these sessions in the near future. Uh, so be on the lookout. Um, next week, we're, we're going to talk about uh, the workflows and do some actual live examples with product. With that said, I'll thank you, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate you spending the time. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk to you soon.